at Psalm 107. So we've gone away quite a ways already. And this one actually has, um, ha I should say, does not have an official title again. But I titled it, Our Cry and His Loving Kindness. It's also what I would call a back and forth psalm. Because we go here and then we go back here. And then we go here and we go back here. We keep going back and forth, back and forth. Okay. Then you're also going to see, as we get through it on some of the slides, you're going to see some line that is highlighted. And the reason that it is, or in bold, I should say, it's probably a better way to put it, because that's the way it actually is. Um, and you will see that this is because this line is repeated um, a number of times. Now, it's, it's interesting of how this psalm goes to the brink here and then comes back and then goes to the brink here and comes back and it keeps doing that over and over again. It talks about, to a large extent, of our crying out to our God for help and his response to it. Our sinfulness and then that sinfulness leading to problems and then our crying out and then his response to it. And this happens time and time again. And I think it's really fitting to go in this order simply because of the fact that's our life. Our lives are very much like that. We go along and slowly on we slip and deeper into some sinful thing. And then we get caught up in the middle of it and it's creating problems. And then we cry out to God, you know, save me from this, help me out of this. And he does and we're lifted back up. And then we go along and everything is good. And when everything is good, we start going bad. Um, and, and then we get down in there, we cry out, and then he does. His loving kindness always is the response. And that part to me has come out amazing. It's not like, you know, this is the fourth time. I'm done with you. Our God never does that. Our God never does that. So Psalm 107, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary. Give thanks to the Lord. Why? Because he's good. For his loving kindness is everlasting. His loving kindness doesn't go on for a while and then stop. It continues. And then, who is supposed to proclaim this? The redeemed. Well, who are the redeemed? Here again, this is church speak again. It's very much a case of, yeah, I, I've heard that word over and over again. And yeah, I, I, I kind of know what it means. Um, it means that I'm part of God's family somehow or other. It's much richer than that. There was a young boy who built a model boat. And this model boat was made out of wood and a lot of little pieces and he got to glue it all together. And he made this thing and it was fantastic. It had a sail on it. And the craftsmanship for a young boy was really quite amazing. So he takes this boat and after it's all completed, he goes down to a little creek and he puts it in there and he's watching this thing as it moves along. A little breeze would come, you know, and help move it downstream a little bit further and he's walking alongside, you know, and it's not that big of a creek, but he really enjoyed it. Well, then suddenly, instead of his little wind, a much stronger wind came and it took that boat and it's gone. It's gone. He's lost it. He had spent hours and hours building this thing. He's going up and down the creek trying to find this thing. And finally, he had to give up because it's, it's gone. Well, many years later, he's working for a company and he does a lot of traveling and he's in a distant town and he's just kind of wandering around a little bit and he's down downtown and he looks in the window of the shop and lo and behold, what does he see? His boat. 
So he goes inside. I got to have that, but that's my boat. The shop owner says, no, it's not. It's my boat. <laughs> you might have thought it was your boat, but it's my boat. I bought it. I mean, it's for sale. Well, but it's my boat. I built it, and I lost it when I was a little kid. The shop owner says, yeah, okay. It's still my boat. You want the boat, you got to buy it. So how much? So they dicker back and forth and finally agree on a price. So the young man buys the boat. And he goes, he takes this thing, he says, you were once lost, you were mine, but I redeemed you. You're mine again. This is the exact same thing that has happened with us. We were lost to Satan, literally. And Satan wasn't going to just give us up. God needed to come up with a way in which he could be satisfied in his justice and his righteousness in order to redeem his people. And the only one that could do the redeeming was Jesus himself. So when the redeemed of the Lord say so, we were lost and then we were bought back with a price. It wasn't like Satan said, oh, okay, well, you, they were yours to begin with, so yeah, you can go ahead and have 20% um, of them. No. Jesus paid for all of us. Hey, it wasn't a negotiation. It was a case of this is what needs to be paid in order to satisfy God's justice and his righteousness so that the sin is atoned for. This is the redeemed of the Lord say so. The redeemed from the hand of the adversary out of slavery, slavery to sin. And then in verse three, and gathered from lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Pretty good description, okay? They were gathered from everywhere. Pretty simple. Verses four and five. They wandered in the wilderness in a desert region. They did not find their way to an inhabited city. They were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Prior to being redeemed, prior to being a child of God, we would wander in the wilderness, or in other words, in a place where there is nothing of any goodness. A desert region, devoid of the necessities of life. Trying to find your way to an inhabitable city. Trying to find your way to a city where I can take refuge, where I can also get what I need because I'm hungry and I'm thirsty. And this genuine hunger and thirst is not hunger and thirst physically. It's a hungry and a thirst spiritually. Because the psalmist here is saying that if you look at the end of that verse, it says their soul fainted within them. The soul doesn't get hungry physically. The soul doesn't get thirsty physically. But the spirit needs rest and peace and satisfaction that can only come from God. The inhabited city is the city of God. Pilgrim's Progress talks about the celestial city. Christian is on his journey to the celestial city. This is the same city that's being talked about here as the inhabited city. So you come from a hopeless life. That's our beginning. And then in verses 6 and 7, and, and they cried out to the Lord. See, you got this hopeless life, and here's our back and forth again. What do they do? They cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And what does he do? He delivers them out of their darkness. He led them also by a straight way to go to an inhabited city. See, they're out in this desert where it is void of everything that's good. And what does God do after they cry out? He responds. He responds not just with, yeah, I see your problem. He responds with, I'm going to help you. I'm going to show you the way. And how is he going to show them the way? 
exactly like he said in Matthew 7, 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. See, the way to heaven is the narrow way. It's the straight way. Okay. The way to destruction is wide open. You can just continue on whatever path you want to be on, and you're on the path to destruction. So here the psalmist is talking about the straight and narrow way. Verses 8 and 9, and here's where we get start getting to the repeats. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the son of the men. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul, and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. Remember we started off with the previous verses in the hopeless state? And it's changed it from the hopeless to glory. Hopelessness to glory. After what? They cried out, called upon the name of the Lord. Verses 10 through 12. There were those who dwelt in darkness in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains, because they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he humbled their hearts with labor. They stumbled, and there was none to help. From hopelessness to glory, and then there's others. Others that are still in darkness and the shadow of death. They're in this darkness that they can't get away from. They can't find their way because they're in darkness. They're prisoners in misery and in chains. Well, you're in misery because you're in the chains of the grips of sin. Why? It says in verse 11, because they had rebelled against the words of God. But if you also remember a line from Scripture, it says where Jesus says, Come to, unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So even in the midst of being a prisoner in misery and in chains, there is hope as long as you're in this life. But what had happened? They had spurned the counsel of the Most High God. God had offered salvation. They say, I don't want it. I'm not interested in it. It's not for me. It might be for you, but it's not for me. I've heard people use those words. You know, that whole Christian thing, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad you have it and I'm glad it helps you and I'm glad you enjoy it and you, it does something for you. It's just not for me. That is actually spurning the words of God. Therefore, verse 12, yeah, therefore, he hungered with labor. They stumbled and there was none to help. See, if people get in this hopeless situation, uh, I didn't see the gunshot go through here. I just heard it. But anyway, we're, I think we're all right. Um, he humbled their heart with labor. They stumbled and there was none to help. There was none to help because there's only one place to go for help. And what does God do? Okay, to the proud, he humbles them. Being humbled by God is actually a good thing. Might not feel that way at the time, but it is. Because God would not humble somebody unless he had a plan for them. Because that humbling actually brings forth a spirit willing to listen. So the concept of being humbled by God because there's no other place to go for help is a good thing. <clears throat> they stumbled and there was none to help. Then, here again, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And what does he do? He saves them out of their distress. Repeats over and over again. Our life is that repeating over and over again. He brought them out of darkness in the shadow of death and broke their bands apart. Trapped in the misery of sin, trapped in the darkness, the shadow of death is appearing. And what does he do? Because they cried out, he takes them out of it. 
He breaks the bands apart. In other words, what was holding them there, he tears it apart. He frees them. Verses 15 and 16. And then what happens? Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness. Here again. In hopelessness. Out of hopelessness by following what God has for us. After crying out and realizing I can't do it myself. And then finding that help that I need. And then what happens? Give thanks for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has shattered gates of bronze and cut bars of iron asunder. All these things that are considered strongholds, God just takes them and tears them away. We think of strongholds. There are many strongholds in our lives. But there are none that are too strong. There are none that can keep us trapped if we cry out and we turn to our God. Verses 17 through 20. Fools, because of the rebellious ways and because of the iniquities are afflicted, their souls, their souls abhorred all kinds of good, and they drew near to the gates of death. We'll stop right there for a second. Fools, in the Bible, a person is a fool, a person who says there is no God. That's a fool. That's why it is so dangerous, and God warns us about this, never call a brother or sister a fool. Because what you're doing is you're saying, this person does not believe in God, period. Okay. Now, there are fools, but they're not brothers and sisters, because they cannot be a brother or sister and be a fool. So it's, there's certain things that you may not say about somebody. And this is one of them. <clears throat> but because of their iniquities are afflicted, okay? Sin eventually causes problems. It does. And they're getting afflicted. Their souls abhor all kinds of food and they draw near to the gates of death. Now, this isn't food in the sense of a bologna sandwich. This is food in regards to spiritual food because it's their soul again. See, we can see it's not physical food, it's spiritual food because, here again, the soul doesn't need a bologna sandwich. Very simple. Okay, so what happens? Well, they abhor all kinds of spiritual goodness. They abhor the, um, all the things of God, all the righteousness of God. And what is, and they drew near to the gates of death. Now, I find it interesting, they drew near. They didn't go to, because look what happens next. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. We're back to that again. We're back to this whole concept of, I see the loving kindness of my God and I worship him and I thank him. And as life goes on and it gets easier and I'm just moving along nicely and slowly and I slip back into the sin, to the sin where I'm, all of a sudden I'm starting to adhore the things of God. And then the real problem set in. And I cry out because I remember he never left me. I left him. Then what happens next? The second part of verse 19. He saved them out of their distress. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Look at that. They cry out and he saves them. He saves them out of their distresses. The problems that they are in the midst of, he provides the strength and the ability to get out of them. How did he do it? He sent his word. In the beginning was the word. The word of God. He sent his word. He sent his truth. And that healed them. Because it's the truth that heals us from sin. And he delivered them from their destructions. Not from their destruction. But the things that were destroying them. Because they had cried out to the Lord 
in their trouble. Verses 21 and 22, and we go back to the same thing. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness. See, they were delivered out of their troubles from their destructions. Now they're giving thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. In other words, I'm loving kindness because of what you've done for me, but also what I see you've done for so many. And then let us also offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his works with joyful singing. Now, a sacrifice of thanksgiving almost sounds like an oxymoron. Um, like, how can I give a thanksgiving sacrifice? Well, it, it's not a burnt sacrifice on the altar. Okay, you didn't take a thanksgiving and put it on the altar and burn it. Right? Um, so, it's going to be something else. Um, see, a drink offering was something that would be poured out, but a thanksgiving offering is when we take something that we have and we sacrifice it for God. Well, what do we have that we can actually sacrifice ourselves? Our our loving kindness for our God. Okay, so take it this way. I have something that I'm going to give up to benefit somebody else, and it's not money, um, but it's maybe time, maybe it's effort. Um, but I'm doing this so that in a way to where I receive no credit for it. I'm doing it in a way that receives no acknowledgement from anybody else. So in order to see to it that I don't receive the credit, that all the credit goes to God, I'm going to do this thing in a way that nobody knows I did it. It's just gonna happen. So I'm gonna sacrifice receiving the credit so that God receives the credit. Sacrifice of thanksgiving. And we tell of his works with joyful singing. Here again, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Verses 23 through 26. And this is the mere expression of his will is shown here. Those who go down to the sea in ships, who do business on great waters, they have seen the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he spoke and raised up a stormy wind which filled up the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens and went down to the depths, for their soul melted away in their misery. If you've ever been out on a very large lake or an ocean, the seas, and had the feeling of where you're going up and down. Now, if you did it on a big cruise ship, you didn't feel it. Okay, you gotta be in a smaller boat to really feel this. And you may or may not have ever experienced it. I mean, I know I did one time, and I tell you, it gets scary. You might say when the front of your cabin cruiser is bouncing down into the water and then popping back up as the water falls off of it. Okay, and then realize that I gotta get turned around. I don't want this hit, wave hitting me sideways because these waves are big. Um, and we obviously we made it, okay? But anyway. This is kind of what it's getting at. You're here in this hopeless situation, seeing the mighty power of God. And your soul melts away in misery because you have nothing that you can claim to except for you remember his loving kindness. But before that happens, 29, 27, and they reeled and staggered like a drunken man and they were at their wits end. This is where you get it when you get yourself in a situation that looks hopeless and you see nothing but dangers around you. And those dangers don't have to be physical dangers. They can be spiritual dangers. But what happens in verse 28? Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. And he brought them out of their distress. Do you see this faithfulness of God over and over and over again? He caused the storm to be still so that the waves of the sea were hushed. The storm God brought. The storm was a demonstration of God's power. 
a greater demonstration of his power is he stopped it. One thing to bring on a problem is another to eliminate the problem. Why the problem? Because we need correction. We need to find ourselves in this hopeless state. For many of us, it's what turns us around. You know, you've heard that line, you know, you can't help them till they hit rock bottom. There is some truth to that. The bad part is there shouldn't be no truth to that because we should not want to get to rock bottom before we need help um, and realize it, but we do. Verses 30 through 32. Then they were glad because they were quiet, and that's the seas that were quiet, okay? That's the they. So he guided them to the desired haven. What happens next? Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness. Turned around, saved, and now let's give thanks. Thank you, Lord, you saved me again. <coughs> and for his wonders to the sons of men. Let them extol him also in the congregation of the people and praise him at the seat of the elders. I've been saved, and I am so excited that I have been saved. I want everybody to know it, not just the people out there, but the rulers, the leaders. I want them to know about the loving kindness of my God. Verses 33 to 36, there's God's control and provision. He changes rivers into a wilderness and springs of water into a thirsty ground, a fruitful land in the salt waste because of the wickedness of those who dwell in it. He changes the wilderness into a pool of water and a dry land into springs of water. And there he makes the hungry to dwell so that they may establish an inhabited city. We went back and we were in the wilderness to begin with, okay, where there's nothing, okay? Now you're back, you're in this wilderness again, that same wilderness, but the nothing now is being changed because that wilderness that I was in, that sinful life of wilderness, has now changed into a life that is filled with the loving kindness of my God. And he takes those, he takes the, the, the wilderness and he renews it. And you see where he changes the wilderness into a pool of water and a dry land into springs of water. He's providing what is needed for that wilderness to come to life. And when it comes to life and makes the hungry to dwell so that they may establish an inhabited city, that inhabited city again is the city of God. Hunger and thirst after righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 37, 38, and the sows fields and plants vineyards and gathers a fruit harvest. Also he blesses them and they multiply greatly and he does not let their cattle decrease. Here you go, Mark, and, and, also and. If you look at that verse, how does it start? And, and, also and. Okay? And he sows fields and plants vineyards, and gathers a fruitful harvest. All these supplies are being provided for. And, but it's not just that, it's also, he blesses them, and they multiply greatly. And he does not let the cattle decrease. That verse is just, it's, it's so unique. I just love that verse, it's and, and, also and. This is our God, it gives more and more, and then what does he do? He also gives more. Verse 39 through 41, when they diminished the bowed and bowed down the oppression, misery, and sorrow, he pours contempt upon princes and he makes them wander in the paths of waste. Okay. Things are bad for the average person. Things are rough. But the princes, the kings, they've got it good. And God says, no. I'm going to bring you on the same level. But what's he going to do with the needy? Those are his. Verse 41, but he sets the needy 
securely on high away from affliction and makes his families like a flock. Here again, we are that flock of sheep. And that sheep flock continues to grow and grow and grow. And the good shepherd is there to provide and watch over us. The world doesn't see it because look at this in verse 42. The upright see it and are glad, but all unrighteousness shuts its mouth. See, the people of the world, they do not see the blessings that we, the people of God, receive. They don't see it as like, well, your life is really good because you have God in your life. And my life is really miserable because I don't. They do not think that way. Because the only thing that they can see is what is physically in front of them. They can't begin to see what there is in this joy and excitement of knowing that I'm a child of God. They can't see that. So all they can see is, well, either you have a lot of stuff or you don't. That's not the Christian life is not based upon the stuff whatsoever. The stuff is totally secondary, third day, way down the road. But then you have to look at verse 43. Who is wise? Let him give heed to these things and consider the loving kindnesses of the Lord. Who is wise? The one that's not a fool. It's that simple. The one that is not a fool is the one that is wise. And then you consider how we've gone from every time we've gone through this. Loving kindness of God. Going down. Cry out. Loving kindness of our God. Go on. Go down. Cry out. Loving kindness of our God. Over and over again. Consider the loving kindness of our God. 